Okay, so um, we then went on to lecture two, where we talked predominantly about cellular oncogenes. Okay, so we talked about, um, in the first lecture, about some of the characteristics we observe at a phenotypic level. So this idea of succession of phenotypes, you know, multi-hits, and um, clonal selection, and some of those concepts. Um, now we're starting to look at what are some of the actual genes that are uh, modified in cells that give rise to cancer. So the most <coughs> um, so when people first started looking um, at at cancers, they they, they th th there was an early theory that um, it was viruses that were causing cancer because the, in the in the 60s, 70s they were they were identifying or associating viruses with cancers and looking at the genomes of the viruses and identifying. Um, some some proteins. So these were called on oncoproteins. Um, but basically the take-home message is that um, most cancers are caused and driven by mutations in the human genome. Okay, so um, but from this early work looking at um, some of the proteins, um, some of the human proteins that were picked up by the viruses, they led to the discovery of these sequences in the human genome and you know, um, so we'll look at some of those. Um, th th clearly, there are some cancers that are caused by viruses, and we, we talk about um, um, cervical cancer and, um, um, and, and and some others. Okay, but um, it, it's unusual for cancers to be causing these for viruses to be causing these cancers, and typically, even in these viral cancers, it's it's a viral protein that's interacting with a key tumor suppressor. Um, and, and inhibiting that tumor suppressor. Okay, um, so there. What are we doing here? So, so it turns out. Um, if we just skip ahead here, that um, these viruses were integrating into the um, human genome as part of the life cycle. They were then um, um, excising themselves from the human genome and on occasion picking up a bit of human DNA in their genome okay and then it was these um, bits of human DNA that contained um, an unlikely event but over you know evolution is going to happen picked up an oncoprotein and um, a mutated oncoprotein was then um, um, had developed and then that when the virus was infecting um, the, the, the host those oncoproteins were being expressed and causing cancer okay so um, but so, so, so that was um, how these human proteins got into the viruses okay and the study of the viruses helped us understand and identify these human proteins um, there was a really good experiment here which um, is shown here um, where they showed unequivocally that it was mutations to human DNA that were driving cancer. So they had some um, some some fibroblast cells. So fibroblast cells are um, cells which grow in culture but that don't contain mutations. Okay, so a, a lot of um, t tissue culture cell lines are actually mutated cells because they grow faster and more robustly in culture. But um, at some point in development of techniques, they were finally able to um, grow normal human fibroblast cells or fibroblast cells from some model organism in on a petri dish. Okay, And then um, they uh, um, could chemically modify with a mutagen those, the, the DNA in those cells and then extract the DNA from those cells. And then when you then, um, th they developed this technique um, which again go to the lectures and we talk about that technique. Um, they developed this technique, calcium phosphate precipitation, to um, transfer the DNA into another cell line. Okay, another normal cell line. Now, um, the mutations caused by the mutagen then um, are able to um, be expressed in those cells and lead to a um, a um, transformation like a, a, a group of cells that are growing at a faster rate than those around them which is the first step towards um, cancer it's one of the hallmarks of cancer and um, even when you um, transfer those cells back into um, a, a, a model organism those cells are then growing at a, at a high rate so within this sort of um, experimental procedure um, it's virus free there's no viruses involved the 
the, they're taking normal fibroblast cells, they're mutating them with a mutagen, they're extracting the DNA, and then, then the, they've got the technique to transfer that DNA into a normal cell line, okay, a normal cell line that hasn't been mutated, and that um, if you can express that mutated DNA within that normal cell line, um, that then is giving rise to um, cells with you know, growth characteristics that are different to those around it, it's growing faster, and therefore you, you, it's able to be tumorigenic. So th this is really sort of um, highlighting that um, human cancers are driven by mutations in human genes, okay? And, you know, we looked in the first lecture about, you know, carcinogens or smoking causing mutations leading to lung cancer. Well, in this experiment in, in, in mice, they're showing that a chemical mutagen is mutating the genome, genomic DNA, and then if you can transfer that DNA into another cell type, that's causing the mutation. In the same way that the virus was 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 infecting human cells and carrying that mutated DNA and driving cancer. Okay, but the important thing is it's the human genes that are getting um, mutated in most of our the cancers. So as we live our lives, we um, either through normal processes or through exposure to mutagens are picking up mutations in our cells, and that these mutations on occasion lead to um, full-blown expression of um, a, a tumor. Okay, so um, it's, it, it's so fairly early on it was established that um, it was these oncogenes that were really the, the one of the driving forces of um, tumor formation. Okay, um, we then looked at one of these um, genes that had been identified as being an oncoprotein, and RAS was one of those. Um, it's such an important gene that it was one of the first ones identified because it tends to be there more often than not in cancer cells. Okay, so they were able to sequence the the um, the alleles and identify mutation in a single um, codon, leading to a different amino acid leading to a protein with a slightly different property okay and that mutation happened to be in in the domain or region of the ras gene that was its gtpase function and therefore it wasn't able to hydrolyze gtp to gdp now why is that important hmm. okay so um let me skip some of this material whilst it's fresh in my mind and let's jump to this one here so um so why is a mutation in a GTPase important for an oncoprotein? So you've got RAS, it's in the, in the off, off state. Um, it's bound to a GDP molecule, okay? Um, during um, normal cellular growth, a process occurs where a guanine exchange factor um, is able to displace the GDP and allow GTP, which is present at a higher concentration in the cells, to then occupy that space where the GDP was. So we now have the guanine exchange factor um, dislodging and causing exchange of the DT GDP, leaving an empty pocket where the GTP can then populate. Okay, so this causes part of the molecule then to have a different structure. So there's a switching loop which is now exposed. All right now um, that can then activate other proteins that bind to and recognize the new structure such as our RAF okay but the important thing here is we're looking at how does that mutation single point mutation in the oncoprotein lead to its hyperactivation and therefore more growth okay so basically there's a process with GDP is hydrolyzed back to GDP, okay? And the enzyme responsible for hydrolysis is RAS, because it's a GTPase. Okay, it's a weak GTPase, but it's a GTPase. So RAS is able to hydrolyze GTP back to GDP, all right? So this gets hydrolyzed, okay? Which then turns off the signaling. But if the mutation in the domain here there's a mutation which which means the protein is no longer able to hydrolyze the GTP then it stays in the active state with that loop exposed okay 
because it can't hydrolyze the GTP. The GTP is causing that to stick out, and RAS with the GTPase will hydrolyze GTP, and that domain pops back in again. That loop can come back down again. But because it's um, got a mutation, then it stays in the on state, and it can still activate by binding to um, a downstream effector. So um, at some point, um, without the mutation, a normal RAS is a GTPase. It hydrolyzed GTP to cleave off one of those phosphates. The gamma phosphate from GTP is cleaved off, and RAS returns to its GDP bound state, which is off. Okay, so um, so if you remember, um, I can't remember my structure, but you've got um, you've got um, you've got a a base here, such as an adenine or a guanine or a whatever, but in this case it's GTP, so it's guanosine, bound to a ribo sugar here, and then um, on the um, five prime, um, one, two, three, four, five, the five prime of the ribo sugar, it has um, three phosphates, your alpha, beta, gamma phosphates, and RAS is a GTPase and it's able to cleave off the gamma phosphate, which convert GTP, the triphosphate, to GDP, the diphosphate. Okay, so it's a pretty basic reaction. Um, excuse me, that's a bit of um, biochemistry from second year, but just in case you know you, you're not sure what's going on here in in the activation of RAS, um, RAS binds GTP. Um, to be activated, and then RAS hydrolyzes GTP to, to switch itself off. And mutations in RAS um, that prevent it hydrolyzing GTP lock RAS into the on state. Okay, And there's a, a, a GAP, a, a, a GTPase activator protein, which enhances the GTPase activity of RAS. Okay, So again, go back to the lectures for that. So. Um, so, so we're talking about point mutations in a gene sequence were identified that um, we now know are mutations in the GTPase activity of RAS and, and um, allow, um, inactivate the ability of RAS to hydrolyze GTP. Um, so these kinds of mutations were identified in lots of cancer types and hence people went on to actually work out what was going on. Um, a, a, a other um, Oncoproteins were identified in um, in Burkitt's lymphoma, where the CMYC gene becomes expressed inappropriately. And um, again, the lectures go through that process, whereby um, you've got these um, genes involved in um, in um, coding for immunoglobins. So. Immunoglobins recognize antigens in the environment, and we there's there's hundreds of thousands of different antigens that we encounter and have to respond to. So we don't have an individual gene for each antigen. That would just be ridiculous. We'd have a genome that was hundreds of thousands of genes big to allow for that. So we have a process of antigen, uh, of immunoglobulin gene shuffling or reshuffling, whatever you want to do. So that different um, shuffling of the genome sequence gives rise to different um, protein sequences, and therefore different binding sites for the different antigens. Okay, again, I'm not an immunologist, so I'll talk to someone who understands this stuff. But, um, but what I want to focus on is that there's a region of the genome which is is being um, cleaved and rejoined, cleaved and rejoined as a normal cellular process to produce all these different um, immunoglobins. Now, sometimes that cleaving and rejoining goes slightly astray and it gets cleaved and rejoined to the C MYC gene by mistake. All right? So you've got this promoter here, which is going to be expressing immunoglobins, is now expressing the MYC gene. Okay? And inappropriate levels of expression, so high levels of expression of the, of the MYC gene occur, and the timing of expression is wrong as well. So you get um, a, like a large time frame of expression and inappropriate levels of expression. So um, another one of these important oncoproteins was um, identified in 
Burkitt's lymphoma. So you have um, the infection leading to the activation of the immunoglobin genes, leading to the, g the gene reshuffling, leading to the translocation to another chromosome where the semic gene gets um, linked to the wrong promoter. Okay, um, and then um, and then we go on to look at um, some other examples of oncogenes um, which have been identified as being involved in cellular signaling um, pathways. And typically the receptor is an oncoprotein because a receptor can be locked into the on position and drive signaling pathways. Okay, so I sort of tried to um, talk about um, signaling generally from a sort of um, a fairly generic point of view just to say that we have receptors on the cell surface we have um, adapter molecules that can um, bind to activated receptors we then have some sort of um, signaling cascades which the ones i talk about involve phosphorylation events so these different kinases um, leading to activating of activation of transcription factors which turn on genes and then that can activate a whole new subset of genes leading to a large phenotypic change okay so that's just a very kind of general um, slide don't get bogged down in all the detail there um, and then um, before we looked at a individual receptor in any detail we looked at the SARC protein and um, the SARC protein has a lot of properties um, that the understanding of SARC led to an, a, a better understanding of the receptors. Okay, so they discovered the SARC protein first. Um, so SARC protein, I don't know how you think about SARC. It's, um, it's a protein that's got um, a tyrosine kinase domain. I'll put a K there for a tyrosine kinase domain. It's got um, tyrosine residues. Um, which, if you remember, tyrosine, tyrosine is just your um, bog standard um, amino acid side chain with an aromatic ring with an OH group on it. Okay, so remember, phenylalanine aniline hasn't got an OH group, and tyrosine has. Okay, um, so um, the kinase can add um, a. Um, oh, it's not I'm not deleting. Uh, tyrosine can. A, a kinase can add a phosphate group to the OH group. All right, and that's all a tyrosine kinase is. It's an enzyme activity that phosphorylates a tyrosine residue on another protein. Okay, so um, getting back to um, our um, SARC protein, um, it has a, a tyrosine kinase domain, it has tyrosine um, residues, and it has a domain called an SH2 domain that can bind to phosphorylated tyrosine. So the kinase can um, phosphorylate itself and then the SH2 domain can then bind to the phosphorylated tyrosine. So effectively you've got um, uh, an enzyme that can um, auto-regulate itself by the kinase phosphorylating itself and then the SH2 domain binding to the phosphorylated tyrosine and that sort of then um, buries the kinase domain within the body of the enzyme so that it can't phosphorylate other proteins okay but um other proteins can come along this is probably too much information but other proteins can come along with a stronger binding affinity to the the, the phosphorylated tyrosine and displace um the um, sh2 domain from the phosphorylated tyrosine and activate the kinase the, the, the kinase domain. Anyway, let's, let's not get too into um, SARC, but an understanding of SARC then led to a, um, a way of thinking about receptors. Okay, so I think in this lecture or, or another lecture, it shows the homology between a receptor tyrosine kinase and 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 the SARC protein. So there's homology there. So it, it becomes apparent that these receptor molecules have these tyrosine kinase domains. All right, um, And then that's important to know because we then go to look at these receptors and, and really we should think about these receptors as dimers that are embedded in the plasma membrane. 
Okay, so this is the um, plasma membrane, and this is a uh, these is uh, two individual monomers of a tyrosine kinase receptor bound to a ligand. Okay, and then understanding that these are kinase domains, we now understand that the binding of the ligand brings the two dimers together and then allows the these kinases to become active, whereas this kinase now is in the vicinity to hydro to phosphorylate um, this cytoplasmic tail. And this kinase can phosphorylate this one. So you get um, regions on the cytoplasmic side of the receptor that can be phosphorylated on the tyrosine residues by the tyrosine kinase domain. Okay, and our ability to look at receptors and understand how receptors work, a lot of that was informed by understanding how the SARC protein worked. Okay, so so SARC was the first oncoprotein studied at any any great level and understood at a me mechanistic level as a little molecular machine, and an understanding of SARC led to an understanding of how these other molecular machines called receptor tyrosine kinases function. Okay, and it's a dynamic process. You've got individual monomers which are brought together by a ligand, all right, and then that bringing together of these 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 individual monomers then bring together on the cytoplasmic side here these tyrosine kinase domains which allow for phosphorylation of each other. So it's a trans-autophosphorylation or cross-phosphorylation. All right, so, um, so we start to look at um, how um, some of these oncoproteins function at a molecular level. So understanding that RAS um, is activated on and off through um, binding to these um, guanosine nucleotides and understanding that um, these receptors are activated by binding to ligands, bringing together the tyrosine kinase domains. Okay, um, And then the lectures also have a bit more of that molecular detail on the activation of RAS. Um, Alright, so then we moved on to another lecture.